Today we're going to look at the foundations of the gut-brain connection and how this can revolutionize potentially your health and your mental health. Hey everybody, Chad Cruiser here with Health and Homestead. Many diseases, both physical and mental, may be connected to the gut. Anxiety and Anorexia, the International Journal of Molecular Sciences, reports on evidence that generalized anxiety and eating disorders ranging from binge eating, bulimia, and anorexia nervosa are all associated with an imbalance of gut bacteria. Going on to things like bipolar disorder, the Journal of Psychiatric Research reports on the potential impact of the gut microbiome, that's bacteria, the bacterial diversity within the gut, on individuals with bipolar disorder and suggests that there may be methods of treating patients with bipolar disorder in connection with their microbiome. So the microbiome being the bacterial makeup of what is in your gut, what is in your intestines. You can think of your mi microbiome kind of like an ecosystem. So you have maybe a pond, you have trees outside of it on the land, you have a field, you have various plants and animals and insects and bacteria. What happens is if you begin to lose some of these, you lose this animal or that animal or this plant or that plant, it doesn't just affect that plant, it affects everything around it. And the same thing may be true within our gut, that if we don't have a good bacterial diversity, microbial diversity within our gut, we may, may end up suffering with mental health problems or physical health problems. Here's research on color in the microbiome. Researchers in the Netherlands looked at babies in their first 100 days of their life and 50% of the babies had colic in the study and 50% did not. And it turned out that the babies that had colic had significantly lower diversity of bacteria than the babies that did not have colic. Now we saw in another video that alcoholics who really struggle may have lower diversity of bacteria. Toddlers who have more tantrums and are more antisocial, they are shown to in general have less bacterial diversity. So this seems to be something that may impact humans throughout their life. Less biodiversity when it goes into our gut, or at least bacterial diversity, may negatively impact our physical and mental health. One of the things that connects the brain to the gut is something called the vagus nerve. I shared in another video how 90% of the information that travels from the gut to the brain or the brain to the gut goes from the gut to the brain, not the other way around. Meaning your brain is telling your gut significantly less than your gut is telling your brain. But what can this have to do with our mental health? Researchers implanted into humans a pacemaker-like device that would stimulate the vagus nerve. And what they discovered is that as they electrically stimulated the vagus nerve, that it lowered levels of depression in the individuals that had this pacemaker-like device. Now, is there a way to not have some invasive surgical procedure? Is there something else we could do that's non-invasive? Well, there's something very simple. It is reported in the journal Frontiers in Human Neuroscience in an article entitled Breath of Life that slow breathing techniques, specifically where you have slow exhalation, slowly breathing out, stimulates the vagus nerves and it helps people to feel more or relaxed. So one of the things that you can do is simply learning how to breathe accurately. Having diaphragmatic breathing, if you've ever taken a choir class, they teach you don't breathe from the upper area of your chest. Instead, you're breathing into your the chest, yes, but also down deep into the diaphragm so that you have a full expansion of the lungs. Now in the research, in order to stimulate the vagus nerve, you had to not only breathe in deeply, but having slow breathing out. One of the ways to do that is breathe out like you're blowing through a straw. So you're going in, into the diaphragm and out. In, out slow. By doing that several times back and forth, the deep inhalations and the slow exhalations, it actually stimulates the vagus nerve. Now that may not be properly the gut-brain connection, maybe that's the brain-lung connection, because the vagus nerve not only connects to the gut, but it also connects to the lungs. When a baby is in the womb, it's in a nearly sterile environment. Generally it's sterile and sometimes things can happen to make that not be the case, but in general they're in a sterile environment and as they pass through the birth canal, that is when they are introduced to the beneficial microbes and bacteria that will begin to help their immune system function. But something can happen when a baby does not come through in the natural way, but rather is taken out by a C-section. Notice what the research says. 
C-section babies have statistically higher disease rates. In a study report in the journal Pediatrics of 2 million babies studied, this is a massive study over the course of 35 years, and they found that C-section babies have statistically higher rates of allergies, asthma, bowel disorders, rheumatism, and leukemia. Now, by the way, I uh, was a C-section baby, and I've had some of all of those issues except for leukemia. I hope they never come down with that, but I've also been able to reverse them by lifestyle changes and so most of these things can be changed sure maybe we don't have all the benefits of somebody else who was born in the way that they were naturally meant to be born but we can potentially do things that will help to maybe reverse some of the damage that we have already received and you probably heard that they've already done studies where they're taking the mother as the baby is born and they're swabbing the mother and taking some of her bacteria and putting it over every orifice and all over the body of these these babies that are born through C-section to help maybe avoid many of the complications that come as a result of not having a natural birth. There's a man by the name of Antonio Stanchich, and he was thrown into a concentration camp around World War II, and while he was in there, he got what people in concentration camps often have, and that's a very spare diet. And while there, he was hungry all the time, and finally he decided, well, maybe I should try chewing more. So he began to chew and chew and chew and chew and chew, and he chewed 100 times, 200 times, 300 times with one mouthful of food, and you think, that's a little extreme. And he said that he found the sweet spot was like 150. By the way, I'm not suggesting you go chew your food 150 times. But he said that when he would chew it 150 times, he would stay warmer in the cold weather and he had more energy. He began to suggest this to some of the other uh, people who were in the concentration camp with him. And you can imagine most people thought, ah, you're crazy because when you're hungry, you just wolf down the food. But a couple of guys decided to do it with him and they found the same benefit. And we're told actually that of the people that came in when Antonio went into prison, that those two or two of, and himself were some of the only people to end up surviving. And then his son, Lino, was later cast into prison and his father had told him this story. He tried it and he found some of the same results. Now, but you might be thinking, but Chad, uh, yeah, that's an anecdote, that's a story, but is there any research to back it up? And the answer is yes. Here's a study where participants chewed their food 10, 25, or 40 times, and they discovered that those who chewed the most received the most nutrition. Now, they were looking at one specific nutrient. It seems that the more we chew, the more nutrition we get out of the very same food. Now, I'm not saying to go and chew your food 150 times, but at least chew it till it's thoroughly masticated, thoroughly broken down in your mouth instead of having you know dry chunks or giant chunks in your mouth the more we chew it the more nutrition and it actually makes us more prone to being full so that we don't overeat some people i have a friend who one thing he changed was ch significantly more chewing and he lost a good amount of weight as a result of that one thing as you chew your food, you excrete a substance called opiorphin. Now, it's an opioid that researchers tell us it has an antidepressant impact. So as you chew, you're secreting this opiorphin. We didn't, I don't think we discovered it until 2006. It's a relatively new discovery. And what they found is that it's an antidepressant. Well, that kind of makes sense because often when people are depressed, what do they do? They eat. And one of the things you can do to kind of curb that desire is chew more. Not only will that give you more satiation, more fullness, and make you feel better, but it will also potentially, potentially anyway, help with your mental health. So you can do the chewing without eating, eating, eating. Because if you just eat, 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 obviously you may feel good in the midst of it, but because you get the dopamine hit, you may get the opiorphin, but the trouble is you start to get overweight and then there's a side effect of being overweight is being depressed. So you can see how this is kind of a, a double-edged sword here. So the thorough mastication or a lot of chewing may help to balance out that impact. One of the things that is important in chewing is that as we eat our food, so if you're eating food, especially let's say you're eating some whole grains, you're eating fruit or vegetables or these kinds of things, as you do, you're chewing it and you're breaking down the structure of the plant. And in those plants, you have fibers. You have soluble fiber, insoluble fiber. And it turns out that soluble fiber is probably the more important form of fiber when it comes to your bacteria, the bacteria within your gut. As you chew it, break it down, it goes into the gut, and you've 
pre-broken it down in your mouth, which is very important. And then as it goes into the gut, you may have heard, oh, you can't digest fiber. That is true, but there's something inside of you that can digest fiber, and that is bacteria. So there are bacteria that come to the fiber, and they begin to, we could call it eating it, they begin to metabolize the fiber. And as they do, they give a byproduct called short-chain fatty acids. And these short-chain fatty acids have a side effect to us that's beneficial and that is that they help lower inflammation. But they've done an animal study that showed that if they had animals eat either a powdered, you know, kind of a substance that they didn't really have to chew much versus something that they had to significantly chew, they would get more short chain fatty acids. And so this may be another reason, uh, along with the opiorphin, but also your thorough chewing is going to help you break it down more so that the bacteria have better access to the fiber so that they can give you the byproduct of short chain fatty acids. And by the way, lower inflammation may also increase happiness because people who are depressed often have higher levels of inflammation. And so you help the bacteria and the bacteria may be able to help you be happier. And actually it changed my life. The gut brain connection. I had all kinds of health issues from migraines, depression. Uh, I could just go on and on achy joints and it was healed through the gut brain connection. If you haven't seen my video where I go into the research on that, you're going to want to check that out. And coming out soon will be the next video where I talk about things that can destroy the bacteria in your gut and how that can negatively impact you and what you can do to avoid that. So if you like this video, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notifications. God bless and have a fantastic day.